Okay, guys. So, so do, do you do you think we can we can probably start? We're exactly at four. Yeah, you can. Shall I shall I just start the webinar? We were doing a practice round currently. All set. Sandeep sir, we can start. Yeah. And just in case, guys, Sandeep sir and I did not align our shirt color. It just happened accidentally. <laughs> okay, okay, guys. So we'll start. All the best. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, my panelists, all of you, uh, a warm welcome, and a very good afternoon to all of uh, all of you who are joining us. Um, thank you. It's always good to see people joining despite the webinar fatigue, and it's always um, you know it's heartening when you see people registering, people logging in. So, to everybody who's joining us, uh, my name is Shankar Sareen. I take care of marketing at Tenable, and today we've got a very interesting discussion being planned. Um, uh, my, my friends at C3I uh, Hub at IIT Kanpur and uh, myself, we put together a very interesting panel discussion. The topic that we will be debating, discussing on would be critical infrastructure at risk, anatomy of an OT breach. Um, I can promise you this would be uh, not like any other conventional webinar where, you know, you've got PPTs being shared, you've got lots of, um, lots of product pitches being made. We have deliberately kept the agenda as very neutral. This would be a discussion being led by Professor Sandeep Shukla, and we've got three experts joining him. Um, so without uh, much ado, let me just move on to some, you know, more of those housekeeping rules. So to all of our um, audience joining in, please um, ensure that, you know, this, this discussion is a two-way street. It's not something that uh, we're just telling you. So if you have any questions, any points that you want to, you know, discuss with your fellow audience or with the panelists, please use the Q&A widget on the Zoom platform. Uh, we would have a Q&A session towards the end, so please do park your questions. We would take them up towards the end. Um, if you can, you know, I would strongly encourage you to introduce yourself while you're asking the question. It just helps us to, you know, if, if we know the industry you're coming from, it just helps the experts and the panelists to give you a use case aligned to your industry. Use the chat option. Uh, you know, if you have a point of view. So you would see that there are two. There is a Q&A option and there is a chat option. Please remember the Q&A is visible to only the panelists while the chat option is visible to everybody. So chat option is more uh, if you have a point of view, if you have a generic thing to share with everybody and Q&A if you want the panelists to look at it. Um, last three are more to ensure that the experience you are getting is up to the mark. So, you know, if you are not in the perfect time zone, or perfect network zone, or if you want to change your Wi-Fi to the right one, please do that right away. We encourage the use of headphones, especially during this time when, you know, your kids, your spouse, everybody's on multiple calls. It just would ensure that the experience is good. And as I said earlier, please do ensure that it's a, it's an interactive session. Uh, now, let me just quickly introduce you to our um, panelists. So, oh, this gentleman does not need any introduction. We've got Professor Sandeep Shukla. I've been told not to go through the entire profile, so I'll just skim through it. Um, he's currently the Professor of Computer Science and Engineering Department at IIT Kanpur. Besides being an IEEE Fellow, he is an ACM Distinguished Scientist. He's got, he's got so many patents. He's reviewed so many books. So, um, you know, uh, I, I, it'll be to fit in his bio in 60 seconds would, would not be the right thing. So I would just leave this um, slide for probably another five, 10 seconds. You could see, you know, anything on cybersecurity, OT, IoT convergence, and he is one guy who is super active on LinkedIn. So guys, um, please do, do interact, do engage with him. And we are so happy that he'll be the moderator for this panel discussion. Amitava, thank you for joining in. Um, uh, folks, Amitava is Director of Cybersecurity at Siemens Limited. Again, a technocrat with more than 20 years of rich cross-cultural experience, IT governance, cybersecurity governance, risk management, ITOT convergence, OT security, 
he's your guy so the idea when we were putting this panel uh, panelists together was to actually give you a perspective you know from everywhere from academia from an oem from a solution provider and from an end customer so amitabha wears that oem hat most of you know the ot systems um, lots of those gear that you see um, on on factory shop floors are from seaman so he he brings that kind of expertise then we've got rohit sharma rohit is a gentleman i had the pleasure of meeting him uh, last week rohit has been with ntpc uh, he's a dgm it there 18 years of experience um, in it out of which 11 years has been predominantly in it security so again um, a gentleman um, joining us he he's the guy who you know who's who's uh, if i can say has his hands dirty he does this every day in and out so he's the guy who is a practitioner come an expert when it comes to it and ot security and last but not the least uh, richard uh, richard is a dear friend he is um, based out of a uh, based out of singapore um he is my go to guy anything on it security or you security even on my macbook not working uh, one person that i <laughs> that i call out to is richard so yes he he's our um, ot guru um, and with that sandeep i'm going to pass the baton over to you please take it on take it forward from here can you also give me share screen uh, facility okay it is there it's there yes so welcome to everybody for, uh, to this panel uh, i think the number of attendees is a little bit thin but uh, i hope that this will be on the web so we can share it with a lot more people uh, so i'll be addressing uh, everybody uh, in the uh, future audience as well as the current audience so as uh, uh, shankar has explained that this is a panel uh this for discussing ot breach that is becoming more and more common these days so let's see what is the current situation so we are seeing a number of nation state actors targeting various sectors power sector being one of the major ones uh so we see that uh, there are cyber attacks on the uh, uh state load dispatch centers or uh, utility control centers etc so we are seeing uh, people at uh, this is from the cyber security insurance uh, magazine so they are actually also seeing this increasing vulnerability of cyber attacks in the power grids uh, <clears throat> we also saw some cases in india we i showed a few pictures earlier but this is one of the scary ones where uh, the north korean uh, detrack malware was found in the it part not in the ot part of a of india's largest nuclear plant uh, <clears throat> ukraine power grid cyber attack 2015 and 16 are actually very uh, illustrative uh, examples of what is happening what's the threat landscape that we are dealing with uh, so <clears throat> uh, so there was uh, first time with uh, uh you know uh, one type of attack and second time it was a different time of type of attack but uh, first time the effect was much much more pronounced than the second time but it's happening uh so iranian uh, cyber attack on one uh, small nuclear uh, so, uh, sorry new york dam which uh, people think was actually targeted towards a similarly named dam which which would have much bigger impact Uh, by flooding uh, at least thousand people, uh, you know, but they seem to have chosen the wrong dam. Uh, <clears throat> so there was a report on reverse rat uh, malware uh, presence in one of the Indian power companies. Uh, Black Lotus Lab reported this in last June. Uh, the Stuxnet, the old story that actually brought to attention the fact that. ot ic system even if they are not connected to the internet are subject to such attacks uh there was steel plant attack in germany so these were these are some of the uh, examples we talked about uh, in almost all the talks so so the aramco uh, so uh, you know oil and gas uh, uh, processing as well as uh, in the oil and gas pipelines uh, there was there is a whole, a whole lot of supply chain attacks that are happening 
uh, now, so uh, we uh, all know about solar winds. Uh, similarly, there was a meat packing plant uh, attack uh, in, in the US uh, uh, you know, this year. And uh, there are several other attacks that we have seen by supply chain compromise. Uh, there was an attack on a Florida water treatment plant. Uh, thankfully, the, um, uh, the person in charge uh, actually found uh, this with uh, a very high dose of uh, uh, sodium hydroxide was being injected into the water almost 1,000 times more than uh, what is safe. Uh, <clears throat> Colonial pipeline attack that we all heard uh, in May this year, which uh, created a huge problem in the supply of uh, oil and gas in the eastern uh, seaboard of, uh, of the US. We also saw a uh, uh, few other cases where uh, red fox trot that uh, has been attacking multiple different countries, including India, that's for various sectors, uh, telecom, government, uh, mining, etc. And uh, uh, now this week, there was uh, the ransomware attack on the uh, sewage plants hit by uh, Maine, uh, in, in the state of Maine in the US. Uh, that was uh, something that uh, happened recently. And this is happening because of the weaponization of vulnerabilities. And so I would, uh, you know, this is not my book, so I'm not doing an advertisement here. I read this book and this is an excellent book as to wh why this is happening, how the vulnerabilities are being weaponized and exploits are being weaponized and being used uh, by nation states, by uh, various uh, uh, organized crime uh, syndicates uh, spread out throughout the world. And, uh, and this is something that we need to worry about. And that's what we are here to discuss, like what should be done. Uh, so now these are uh, uh, slides uh, borrowed from uh, Richard. Uh, so some of the common myths that we hear uh, among the uh, uh, people who are actually own this uh, critical infrastructures, utilities, etc. Uh, one of the things we hear a lot is uh, uh, we don't connect to the internet, so we cannot be attacked. Or they say that our control system is behind a firewall, so we cannot be attacked. Or hackers don't understand our control system, it's too complex, so, so they cannot attack us. Uh, our facility is uh, not so important, so it will not be attacked. Or our safety systems will protect us. So all these are basically common misunderstanding of the current threat line landscape that we are dealing with. And this is rapidly evolved in the last few years. Uh, and uh, especially last two years, it has been quite bad and it's going to be very bad uh, in the near future. And uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, President uh, Biden and the, even uh, President Trump together in last 10 months has uh, uh, put out three executive orders on critical infrastructure security. So you can imagine how serious this problem is. So, uh, so now coming to the uh, structure of these systems. So uh, this is basically what we call the Pardew model, how the IT system and the OT system are connected, how they're divided into control zone, demilitarized zone and the enterprise zone, uh, et cetera. And so you can see that, you know, all these uh, systems usually have these field devices and their instrumentation, like for sensors and actuators, et cetera, which then, uh, you know, are controlled uh, often locally by the direct control layer. And that's where the PLC, the programmable logic controller or DCS, et cetera, are sitting. And then uh, you have the remote, uh, terminal units often uh, to actually send this real-time data, which is being uh, brought through the, uh, you know, this uh, instrumentation uh, to the, uh, you know, supervisory control layer, which is, uh, we have SCADA, the supervisory control and data acquisition system, various human machine interface and engineering workstations. Also this control can flow from here down to the lower levels, as well as uh, the control information or control actions are supervised 
configured, programmed often from this layer. And then you have the uh, site supervisory layer where you have historical uh, real-time data that is uh, archived. You have uh, DNS and uh, program, uh, you know, uh, PLC program repository. You may have jump hosts. You may have some other kinds of application servers that sit here. And then we have the demilitarized zone, uh, which is now separating this level. So this is level three and the next level that is level four, which is the corporate land. And uh, therefore, and also uh, it separates the level four to level three. So the flow of data from uh, the corporate land level to the lower levels uh, has to be mediated through the firewalls in the DMZ. Now that does not mean that there are not other ways to attack. Sometimes people actually give vendors direct access to this control zone. Uh, there are other ways to actually get into the systems. Uh, we, you know, we can uh, you know discuss that uh, later uh, if if uh, it comes up. And nowadays there is also a tendency to actually offload some of the business functions to the cloud. Uh, and then you have this uh, corporate LAN, and then you have the uh, the uh, uh, enterprise network. And beyond that, you know, you're connected to the internet. So you're connected to the internet at this level, uh, you know, DMZ as well as three, four. But sometimes you make give access, as I said, to VPN and other ways into this, uh, uh, into this control zone because of convenience, and that might actually bring in uh, various attack possibilities. Finally, I want to just uh, mention, and I will not take too much time, about the Ukraine attack in 2015, because we are talking about anatomy of OT bridge, and that anatomy has to be studied and understood, because that gives us the, uh, the, uh, the techniques and tactics used by attackers these are very resourceful attackers. These are not some hobby hackers or something. So they have a lot of uh, reconnaissance activity, ground intelligence activity, through which they know exactly how your control system works and what are the different uh, components of it. What is the connectivity of between them? Uh, whether uh, what versions of software, uh, hardware, etc., you're using? Whether those things have uh, known vulnerabilities? And sometimes they also exploit the zero day vulnerabilities, the vulnerabilities that are not known. So there were like uh, three, uh, so stage uh, one in this attack was a spear phishing with a word document, which came to one of the employees, which delivered the black energy three malware. And then it connected to the command and control center. So it established persistence, and then it started harvesting credentials for VPN access. So uh, then it, since it got the VPN access, it has much better mobility into the system. And uh, at least in one of the, uh, well, Oblinargos are the uh, power system utilities, uh, the Ukrainian term for that. The attacker discovered a network connected to the UPS system, the, uh, the uh, emergency power uh, backup system, and they reconfigured it. So this is uh, a, a multi-directional uh, attack. And then uh, three of the uh, power utilities, uh, even though they use different distribution management systems and therefore the attacker, after obtaining all this information into their command and control center, they actually customize their tactics for the three different uh, the, the distribution management system. Then they actually, uh, uh, you know, went in and then you put malicious firmware in the serial to ethernet devices, install the kill disk application so that there is no log can be uh, you know, uh, obtained from this. And they actually uh, uh, took over control and, and, and basically uh, employed the breakers to disconnect the lines. And then they actually uh, did the attack. And in the meantime, they also did the, uh, use the UPS modification they uh, managed to do so that there is no backup and therefore there is no uh, quick recovery or logging, et cetera. So there was full, uh, you know, darkness even in the utilities themselves. And at the same time, they created uh, telephonic floods against the customer support lines. 
So the so customers are in dark. They don't know what is going on. They cannot reach the utilities and there would be much more panic uh, and much more possibility of uh, damage uh, that uh, can be exacted. So this is how these operators operate. So this is a picture of uh, you know how these stages uh, go. And then if you go into this, uh, uh, what we call the MITRE ATT and CK mapping. So in this mapping, so, so basically this, if you look at the anatomy of the OT bridges, it starts with an initial access through phishing or other mechanisms. Uh, sometimes by, by, by putting an USB stick, which is uh, laced with malware, then the initial, initial payload executes, <coughs> it gets the persistence, then it tries to find a privileged access or do some privilege escalation through some vulnerabilities. Then it evades by hiding itself so that the normal uh, antivirus on other mechanisms uh, for um, observing or monitoring the system do not see them. And then they start lateral movement. Uh, once they reach the firewall from IT to OT, they start collecting more information so that they can customize their payload, send it to the command and control. And the command and control then inhibit any kind of response functions. Uh, I mean, sends further payload, which inhibits the response functions. If there are any automated response uh, mechanisms, then they impair the process control. And then that leads to the impact, blackouts and, and industrial accidents, etc. So I think I have gone through a very uh, fast uh, wind, wind, uh, wind tour of uh, you know uh, my understanding of the OT bridge. So what I want to do is now I want to ask. Uh, so we have in the panel a uh, uh, Amitav, Amitava who is actually from a equipment um, a manufacturer, equipment maker, and then we have uh, Rohit who is actually from a user. Uh, utility or uh, NTPC is bigger than a utility, but uh, you know you can think of they uh, they own a lot of OT ICS assets. And then we have a solution provider. Richard is from Tenable, who is the solution provider. So we we our goal is to get the perspective of from each of these that when this thing is happening and we are uh, you know uh, always exposed to this possibility then what are these different uh, uh, providers, uh, equipment and uh, you know, integration providers versus uh, the actual users of those equipments and, and, and infrastructure to the solution provider, what are their roles in make, ensuring or rather reducing possibility of a, 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 an OT ICS uh, attack that could actually have a very uh, large impact. So I will start with Amitabh and I will ask him that given this situation that I described and, and first of all, he can add more to my uh, you know, uh, view of uh, the situation. And then he can tell us what is it that uh, a company like Siemens uh, is doing? Uh, because I'm sure that you know, 20 years ago, Siemens was not thinking about these. Uh, and some of the equipments have a lifetime of 20, 30 years in, the, in this sector. Uh, in this industrial control sector. So what is the Siemens' uh, way of responding to this evolving threat scenario and, and what uh, he, uh, you know, how he views their responsibility as well as what actions are being taken. So Amitam. So thank you, uh, Professor Shukla. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So I will, I will rather uh, uh, be a little generic because I will, I am not authorized to share uh, strategies of my own organization. But in general, keeping when I, uh, OT manufacturer OEM in view, it is not only one singular organization. I I am trying to give a generic uh, you know idea about how all OEM manufacturers are responding to keep pace and address uh, the kind of you know, requirements of OT cybersecurity at this time. First of all, we all know the equipment manufacturers never anticipated, maybe a decade before, the kind of cybersecurity environment that is going to happen today or day after. So obviously, yes, there was a gestation period in general when all the OT manufacturers have looked into this topic. But I think by now, every OT manufacturers are absolutely sensitized 
they are absolutely aware that to sustain in a, uh, this kind of environment, they cannot afford to stay back and as compared to, say, the, the counterparts in IT world as such. So all OT manufacturers are, have been investing heavily in research and development, in, in cyber-secured products. So we call it cybersecurity by design. Uh, so at the same time, um, there is also an observation that typically the, the OT uh, consumers, or OT equipment consumers, uh, the level of awareness or the level of sensitization, the kind of preparedness that probably is existing in the same organization in the IT area may not be prevalent in the OT area as such. So I think over and over making security by design, uh, making product uh, computer emergency response team uh, very very active 24 7 365 days or maybe providing facility to subscribe on product cert updates or alerts along with that they are also coming up with you know cyber secured enabled uh, uh, services like say offering IEC 62443 assessments for the OT equipment consumers environment to understand and help them to identify the gaps. And majority of the OT manufacturers, including Siemens, we are also now you know, offering cybersecurity enabled services to perform audits, to protect the environment, to make it cyber secure, to implement you know, network uh, segmentation, to implement the Pardew model, and to handhold and part of the journey of being cyber secure in the OT environment. So this is in a very, you know, overall uh, in a kind of in a high level encapsulated kind of approach that this OTI manufacturer is taking. Thank you, Professor Shudra. Back to you. Thank you, Amitav. So uh, let's hear on this. Like, so Amitav said that, uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of things that uh, this uh, OT manufacturers are doing, uh, you know, and even going beyond uh, providing service, uh, providing audit service, etc. So let's uh, hear from Rohit. Like uh, you know, he uh, as a user, did, uh, is he is he feeling uh, that change in uh, towards uh, uh, you know the manufacturers towards the uh, customers OT infrastructure? Yeah, thank you, Professor Shukla. So uh, as was rightly pointed out by Amitabh that initially uh, the focus was more on IT security. And uh, IT is far behind uh, compared to OT in securing their system. But ultimately, we have to uh, understand that the uh, impact of an OT security breach is much far reaching than a breach in IT system of an enterprise. So uh, in case of a cyber attack uh, on an IT system, most uh, probable occurrence would be a economic loss to an enterprise, say a reputation loss or brand value loss or loss of revenue. But in case of a uh, breach uh, on an OT system, there are far reaching consequences on the public health and public safety and day-to-day -day life of citizens can be disrupted by a OT breach. For example, uh, in the case of colonial pipelines incident, we have seen that there were uh, significant uh, disruptions in the uh, delivery of uh, gasoline and other uh, refined products to the east coast of the US. So uh, uh, that is why the OT security has become much more important uh, and we need a, a, a lot of effort in this direction. So there are uh, significant uh, regulations in pipeline from the government side also and we are facing uh, as an asset owner, uh, in the generic terms, uh, uh, we are facing uh, significant amount of oversight and uh, say, uh, monitoring from the regulatory agencies also. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this has been a part of uh, increased focus in the organization itself. And uh, we are also focusing on OT security and uh, we in touch with all of the OT OEMs uh, like uh, Siemens and other uh, whose systems that we are using uh, as an organization. Yeah, and in the last uh, two, three years, we have seen that there are significant uh, strides that have been taken by the OEM uh, in securing the system. Uh, as Amitabha has rightly pointed out, 
uh, security by design is a very important concept that has uh, been uh, now incorporated in the OT system. Uh, and uh, we think it will go a significant way in securing the OT system that we have deployed. So that is my take on this. Thank you. And I will now request Richard to, uh, uh, you know, opine on this, that uh, is he, uh, as a solution provider, how does he interact with the equipment uh, providers uh, for security OT system? Okay. Uh, well, how, how do we interact with the equipment providers? Um, pretty much uh, very, I'd say very well. Um, in some cases, not directly. Okay, because uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, our technology is installed in the environment um, and, and very frequently in environments that have a very heterogeneous architecture with multiple vendors. So we tend to be, I would say, vendor agnostic. We support all the major vendors without technology, but uh, there is no uh, special uh, relationship, uh, I'd say, with, with, with any, any one of them beyond cooperation, uh, you know, with vulnerabilities that we manage to find with our research organization. There's a couple of things I want to comment that Amit uh, Baba, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, Amitava uh, said, thank you, Amitava said, and I think the one, the, the one thing that struck a nail, uh, my, uh, my toe is the level of awareness isn't there in OT in terms of cybersecurity practices. And a lot of things that I've seen in OT environments um, that people do as general practices are things that would be absolutely uh, unheard of in the IT arena. Uh, fundamentally, things like having Windows XP machines by the dozens uh, still in service in these environments I think presents a significant risk. It's something that would not be done in an IT world, but it is definitely uh, present in, in the OT world. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we need to um, be aware of it. I think we need to really do a lot to increase the awareness of, uh, of uh, people in operational technology environment as to how important it is. And I think, I, I think I'd like to express it this way. When we talk about cybersecurity in an operational technology environment, I think we need to express it in the context of what the KPIs are for someone who's operating a facility, right? So I'm not going to go into an IT environment, an OT environment, sorry, and talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I'm going to go in and I'm going to talk about safety. I'm going to talk about availability. And I'm going to talk about consistency of the process or quality of the product or whatever the plant happens to be making. Those three things are the fundamental KPIs of anybody who's responsible for operational technology. End of discussion. But the nice thing is we can pivot good cyber hygiene practices and directly map common cyber hygiene practices in IT to meeting the KPIs in an OT environment of, of, of uh, security availability, uh, I'm sorry, safety availability and, and uh, an overall quality. Uh, the second thing uh, that I'd like to comment on that I believe anyone who's responsible for an OT environment needs to do, and I, I kind of, this is kind of our philosophy. It's first of all, create a baseline of um, assets because I find that most operational technology environments, even to this day, are just beginning their, their cybersecurity journey. They don't have an accurate inventory of what's present in the environment. You don't know what you need. Uh, you don't know how to protect stuff until you know what you've got to protect. Very simple concept. So start with a, um, you know, a very detailed inventory of every type of asset. And those assets will include, and this is very important, will include uh, obviously operational technology assets, but significantly a large population of commercial off-the-shelf off -shelf operating systems that are supporting functions like HMIs and digital control system workstations and engineering workstations and so on. Um, that's a very important. And the fact is those commercial off-the-shelf operating systems are typically, I think the, uh, you, you said it yourself, Professor, um, if you look at the, um, the uh, uh, Ukrainian power, power grid breach, 
Um, that is the, uh, basically that's the encyclopedia on how to do it. <laughs> okay, that is the recipe for how to do a cyber attack. It's the best one I've ever seen. It's my favorite example. Okay, but look at the attack vectors. What was it? It was the IT environment, straight on. So you need to pay particular attention to the IT devices that live in the OT world. Okay, fine. Inventory is important. Next thing that's important is an inventory of the traffic patterns. Because in an IT environment, the traffic patterns are going to be very consistent, very predictable, very stable, which means it should be straightforward to, um, I would say, establish a baseline of what traffic patterns are. So now I've got an inventory and a baseline of my stuff. I've got an inventory and a baseline of how my stuff is talking to each other. Now my next thing I need to do to have a secure environment is to enforce that baseline. Meaning to say, look for deviations from the proper baseline. Deviations are either misconfiguration or an early indication of some type of cyber activity, some type of malicious cyber activity. So that, that, I'd say that uh, from Tenable's perspective, that's kind of the, uh, the thumbnail sketch of, of you know, what we believe in and how it works. But the fundamental problem to me, and I see it all the time, is a lack of mutual respect and a lack of understanding. I'm, I'm saying it very, very uh, bluntly, okay? A lack of mutual respect and a lack of understanding between the IT organization and the OT organization. And that has that wall, that division has to be broken down. That's the biggest problem we have right now. Okay, you gotta, you know, basically IT people need to learn to speak OT and OT people need to learn to speak IT. It's that simple. Thank you. So uh, my, uh, my next question here is actually for Daniel. So I, I, sorry, I, I'm going to make you speak again. Uh, so you actually work with a lot of uh, you know uh, utilities uh, and industries to uh, solve their cybersecurity problem or provide uh, solution strategies, etc. So what are the uh, major uh, kind of tools? Without going into your specific uh, company's tools, I mean the generic description of what are the major uh, solutions that uh, are required. Uh, you know, beyond the fact that you said that, the, you know, there has to be a baseline established and you have to stick to the baseline by, uh, you know, uh, doing anomaly detection and uh, probably, uh, you know, making sure that uh, your assets have no vulnerability. So you do probably vulnerability management. But what are the other, uh, you know, what is the, uh, if, I, if I have a wish list of cybersecurity tools or solutions that uh, when I'm establishing a new OT, I should go off, go for. What would be the type of uh, solutions that you would suggest? Okay, my answer is going to be a little bit bizarre. Okay, um, first, a good security framework based on standards. Mm -hmm. And NIST uh, publication eight, I believe it's publication eight hundred. I forget the exact number is a very, very, very good place to start. And this is uh, very well uh, documented and easy to understand and very clear. And I think it pretty much touches everything that you need to do. Basic tool number one is to have a, a, a framework that you're going to follow and policies and procedures that map to that framework before you even buy uh, a single piece of equipment. Very simple. Second thing is education of the people who are responsible for the environment. And again, I, repeating myself, IT people need to learn to speak OT and OT people need to learn to speak IT. Very simple, okay, uh, that's, that's the second thing. The third thing um, in terms of security, going beyond what we do, because we help you, and basically we give you the visibility, but we don't do anything else, okay? <laughs> um, very careful discipline in terms of what, external networks might be connected to the OT environment and very strict, I'd say, uh, policies to very tightly control traffic that can uh, go between the two environments up to and including the employment of data dials, which I actually, they're a real pain in the butt, but actually they have a reason to be there and they do a good job. So it lets stuff out for the enterprise to see, but nothing can come the other way. 
The other thing I think that's a very serious problem in most places I see is uh, technically, if you go down to level uh, one and level two of the Purdue model, you're going to find that these areas are very frequently implemented as flat from, a, from an internet, internet perspective, flat layer two networks. And there's not any segregation between the various parts in these networks. Okay, so basically I've got a flat network with hundreds of thousands of things on it. And that means that any attack or any kind of malicious activity that enters one side of the environment can instantly propagate to the other side of the environment. So I call that segmentation, I call it vertical segregation. So breaking up the uh, facility into multiple parts that are segregated logically based on function. So if one part gets compromised somehow, it can't spread to the rest of the place and really ruin your day. I think those are three things. But of course, never, uh, always, always um, very important is um, the monitoring of, of, uh, of the traffic to ensure that any malicious activity is, is detected fairly quickly. I think that's a very significant thing to do. Um, what else? I, I think I've named a lot of them. Uh, I don't think I've missed anything really. Oh, authentication, right? So who has what privileges in the environment to do what things? So I'm talking about a strong role-based authentication uh, mechanism that probably doesn't exist today in most OT organizations. In most OT organizations, you've probably got the password to the DCS, you know, tacked up to the terminal. Uh, and that's common practice, you know, sharing passwords, things like that. So those are just some things I think uh, that are, are, are important in, in, the OT, in the OT world that we need to start to embrace. You talked about uh, segmentation and you talked about authentication. So uh, what about uh, zero trust? That seems to be a combination of these two. So that's a, that's a good question. And zero trust, I, I'm kind of uh, thinking about where that begins, okay? Um, it may, have a place at some point in, in the future. I, I would say going to future developments uh, by the manufacturers. I think that there may be, uh, for example, certificate-based or trust-based authentication taking place between say the controllers at level one and the digital workstations and HMIs at level two. Um, that is a very real possibility to ensure that the controlling devices can only authorized controlling devices can talk and communicate to the controlled devices. And that gets rid of a whole swath of potential uh, compromise vectors. But operationally, if you think about it, it gets to be fairly complicated unless the software that configures this stuff is, is well written to automate. So for example, I have a PLC go bad. Oh God, if you don't have the right software, you're going to be having people who are relatively unskilled in IT trying to figure out how to do digital certificates. What a nightmare, right? So there's a, there's a trade-off in terms of where the, what level of the Purdue model you start to employ zero trust uh, networking. I believe what's probably going to happen, and I'd love to hear Amitava's position on this, is I'm probably going to see zero trust networking from level 2.5 to level three up and then back down. But within the plant itself, I'd be surprised if we went to that level of sophistication. But I, 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 that's my opinion. I think Amitava might have a completely different opinion being yeah. from an equipment vendor. Amitava, you want to comment on this? Uh, where is he? I he's there. I, he, he, can he? He's dark, so he, he went into No, the, he's uh, there. I just saw him move. Oh. <laughs> He moved himself. He's no, he, frozen. Is he, is he frozen? Is he in a bad network? Yeah. Um, I, mean, so, I, I guess until he comes back, we can ask uh, Rohit about this. Like, you know, is he seeing zero trust uh, uh, being uh, used by companies, uh, you know, utilities uh, in thermal, for example? Yeah, either that or he'll say nothing because that's his company's master plan. He can't talk about it. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. I think zero trust has, uh, as a concept, has started evolving in the IT domain right now, and is going to be quite some time before even we start uh, this concept in the OT domain. Uh, in my opinion, 
so it is going to take some time because uh, a lot of ot system functionality is based on the mutual trust between these systems and there are very few enforcement points in which we can deploy security policies uh, in the ot system so i think zero trust is uh, quite some uh, as some distance to travel to reach the ot domain uh, that is my take on that in terms of securing an ot system we have to take it as two uh, say two prongs so for uh, Coming in new OT systems, those are going to have a security by design inbuilt by the OEM. So uh, it is going to be much easier uh, for an asset owner to secure these systems. And as uh, Dick was already talking about the framework, so I think IEC 6243 does a great job of providing a framework to all of the stakeholders in the uh, OT asset life cycle uh, to ensure that the system is. secure from conception to delivery to the asset owner then uh, from installation to commissioning and then regular operation so i think ic 6243 will be the main standard uh, emerging as a winner uh, in terms of framework that is my personal opinion and uh, rather uh, in the other prong uh, for securing the legacy systems the main challenge is uh, for any asset owner is to secure these systems because there is no inbuilt security when these systems were designed so all of the security has to be a bolt on type of security control that has been deployed and deploying a preventative control in a operational legacy uh, uh, ot system is a big challenge because uh, you cannot afford to have disruption so even uh, say you cannot have a penetration testing done uh, on a live ot system because of uh, disruption in service so there is uh, quite uh, um, a lot of hurdles in securing the legacy system and that is uh, uh, the area on which i would like to have an opinion from amitava uh, so what uh, there are their plans are on uh, these kind of systems so new systems are fine what about yeah. the old ones amitava first uh, you respond to daniel about uh, the uh, um, about the zero trust and how what uh, uh, you know how likely it is uh, for we manufacturers to actually uh, provide uh, digital certificate based authentication automation uh, of these and second thing is what uh, rohit is asking is about uh, legacy uh, devices uh, and legacy assets and and their security what the manufacturers can do but he has gone dark again That's unfortunate. Yeah, that's maybe he should dial in. We can dial into Zoom, you know. That might be a solution. Yeah. Uh, that's a little uncanny. Whenever uh, we ask him, he, that's the only time. Otherwise, I could see his fingers moving. I could see. Yeah, him. yeah. I saw, I saw him momentarily, and then he disappeared. Hey, Sorry. No, no, no worries. He's just sent a message. Uh, no worries, Amitava. We we we'll probably wait for you to you know get unfrozen. Yeah. So, yeah, so well, I, if he if he turns off his video, it might produce more bandwidth, and things will be better. But yeah, yeah. just try. So in the meantime, we we'll go ahead with the question I have planned for Rohit, and that is uh, first thing uh, I think he he has already uh, said a few things about the, my original uh, question that I had uh, uh, I wanted to pose to him. That is the role of the. He, 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 utilities and and companies like his who own the uh, ot ics assets uh, what how how they are doing in terms of uh, securing them but i also want to add one more thing um, so you know this power, uh, this water treatment plant attacks uh, that that i i was showing I, it turns out that many many of the uh, uh, power power especially thermal generation they actually use these uh, water treatment plants for uh, you know recycling uh, their need for water uh, and therefore any attack on the water treatment plant could actually be utilized to attack the uh, power system so so this brings up the issue of the interdependencies so so the my uh, uh, so you can you can say a few things about the, how how you are getting on with the securing the ot assets 
but also uh, please, if you could say a few things about how you uh, how the uh, view is in terms of uh, these interdependencies and so uh, some attack that might be uh, you know more on the water treatment plant side and um, you know but that how is that being uh, taken into the threat intelligence of the power operators for example yeah thanks so uh, as per my knowledge of a power plant so the water treatment plant is usually a inbuilt uh, asset of the power plant itself and it is used only to top up the plant water which is already inside the boiler so that is based on my limited knowledge because i am not uh, an expert on the uh, power plant uh, operation per se so that is uh, what i know of it and so there is no cascading effect or interdependency of a wtp uh, on the power plant itself so that is uh, the my take on the second question that you asked in terms of what uh, uh, in a generic way utilities uh, are doing so see uh, it all starts with the framework as uh, uh, richard was already talking about so uh, earlier the framework used to be iso 27000 which was uh, much more targeted on the it side of uh, the security and now we are uh, looking after iic 6244 to take it uh, into much more depth uh, to secure our ot system then uh, so uh, i think most of the concepts uh, in cyber security can be uh, derived from uh, what uh, is a uh, history of conflict in human history so ultimately a cyber uh, attack or a cyber conflict is similar to what happens in a, a natural man uh, natural domain so if you see the military history of human kind you can see uh, several prevalent thoughts uh, in this history so for example uh, a chinese strategist uh, named sun tzu Uh, talked about this uh, uh, as a uh, tactic of warfare uh, several thousands ago, uh, several thousand years ago, in his uh, legendary book named Art of War. So one of the points he made was that uh, if you know uh, yourself and if you know the enemy, then you need not afraid to be in a thousand battles. Okay. So similarly, if we apply this in the field of cyber security, knowing yourself. Uh, will mean knowing all of your systems uh, what exactly you are trying to defend what is your asset inventory in terms of hardware uh, in terms of software what your people are like what is their awareness level so that, that is basically knowing your organization and the systems that you are trying to protect and knowing the enemy would like uh, be making a uh, profile a risk profile for your organization what kind of threats you are facing are you facing uh, are you going to face a nation Uh, state adversary or uh, a hacktivist group or some kind of corporate espionage so uh, once there is a, a significant work uh, being done by the organization on these uh, both of these uh, arenas i think uh, a very uh, good security posture can be derived from both of these uh, uh, prongs so uh, that is uh, my core thought on uh, security and organization <laughs> so uh, in terms of framework we are uh, looking at iic 6243 going forward and uh, we uh, are also uh, using the other uh, uh, systems and technologies at our disposal uh, like setting up a uh, uh, cyber security operation center and the other monitoring and audit mechanisms so that we are already uh, have, or we have already something and uh, people are also exploring uh, what is available in the market So zero trust is one thing that is a promising candidate for having a pretty good security posture. That is there, and uh, yeah, lastly, in terms of auditing, so auditing remains a challenge for OT systems. As Amitabha has uh, pointed out, that they are uh, uh, they are going into this arena of putting quite a specific uh, uh, competency for auditing. So that capacity is currently not uh, existing in the market uh, because. you can find uh, auditors for it systems uh, for security audit but it is very difficult to find a good uh, security order to do a audit of a ot system because these kind of auditors will need, need to have 
uh, expertise on both the IT side and the OT side, which is very difficult uh, to set to maintain. As uh, Richard was already pointing out that these two guys uh, are uh, quite averse of each other and they don't talk in the other's languages. So yeah, that capacity, I think, uh, will need to be uh, built up in this arena. Yeah, that's my thought on this question. Yeah. So Amitabh, are you back? I saw you momentarily again. Yeah, I am back. I'm so sorry. There was some hitch on my side. So maybe I'll pick up uh, from what Vic was indicating while I was about to uh, give my responses. So I, I completely resonate what he said primarily on, on a very, very critical topic about asset visibility. That what he also touched upon. Yes, in OT environment, predominantly asset visibility is a challenge. So there are a lot of uh, you know uh, tools which are has has, has gained a lot of you know uh, importance or you know has been in use quite used widely. We can use any of those tools. I am purposely not taking a name of the tool because uh, it's it's a different uh, kind of discussion today. So we can actually use those tools, be it uh, uh, something which uh, OEM brings on their own or something which is available on the shelf. The second, as he mentioned about education, that's a very, very, before I go to OT, zero trust in OT, I just wanted to you know, conclude with this as well, because they're all interconnected. Because when you talk about zero trust, we always keep IT in mind probably. So the level of uh, sensitization, the level of education, the level of preparedness, the level of technology, and the uh, candidate which is mature enough to actually implement zero trust is more predominantly existing in IT today. So even if OEM manufacturers make their product design and capable to implement zero trust within them, then also we have to speak about the same point which was identified, which was mentioned by Dick as well, about trading off. Because you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of, uh, uh, the people who will be driving this are not predominantly niche IT guys because handling an IT equipment is completely different compared to handling an OT uh, equipment. So typically the zero trust will take some time to reach to that maturity level to get absolutely implemented in a kind of you know, a security by design kind of concept there as well. So you have to reach there. That's something where we should aim to. And yeah, yes, uh, so from that perspective, zero trust is the future probably but at least some components and concepts of zero trust can still be implemented. So it is not only the technology which brings in zero trust as a practice. So zero trust, if we just slice and dice it in different perspective, can probably certain amount of concepts can still be adopted, implemented into destiny as well. So it may not be a certificate based authentication, but maybe some enhanced level of authentication, some amount of additional physical security control, some amount of additional education, maybe a mere uh, USB drive scanning before it is used in OT environment can probably one sub, 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 sub component of zero trust culture in the company. So if we are talking about zero trust as a concept and a technology, it might take some time, but if we are trying to consider it as a culture, probably that is something which can even add up today. So that's what I feel at it. Thank you, Professor. Uh, one more question that Rohit uh, uh, wanted to know uh, from you is, mm -hmm. uh, so one complaint I hear a lot is that these OEMs, uh, they charge a lot for, uh, you know, so they have a, a thing based on Windows XP, but then uh, when if you want the same product for Windows 10, they are not going to give it for free, uh, they are actually charging a whole lot more. So uh, this is creating a huge um, problem with respect to security. So uh, how do you solve this problem? So, you know, I mean, uh, I think apart from uh, a couple of our participants, uh, others may still uh, understand in Hindi, Oman dialogue, so it's not that everything that we have in our current you know, ecosystem needs to be protected. So we can, again, apply a risk-based approach. I completely agree with what Rohit complained. Yes, it's true. Because OT components life cycle compared to IT components life cycle are quite different. So something which was, uh, if the life cycle can be matched, then probably this security updates can also be matched. 
But I think that makes the things more interesting and more exciting. Mm. I mean, if we have a straightforward solution, probably we know what to do. So probably now it makes us more creative, more uh, kind of you know innovative to find a solution together. So Rohit, we are completely ready to co-work and uh, arrive at a solution, including I've also heard about your uh, concern about availability of adequate resources to perform OT cybersecurity assessment. So that is something OT manufacturers, including us, are also very keen to enhance. We have already taken a lot of steps into it. You will find certified professionals performing assessments everywhere sometime later. We are already doing a lot of assessments in the ecosystem. Uh, so Rohit, we'll be able to work together. So just uh, you can reach out to your best OT cybersecurity partners, including your OEMs. Give them an opportunity. I'm sure they'll be able to address your concern. But on the pricing part, uh, I will not be able to comment. That's something which is out of my domain. Yeah, uh, I, I do that actually. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, I want to now we have about 15 minutes left and I want to open this for uh -huh. audience. But before that, uh, uh, we have, uh, I see um, uh, Daniel Aaron Rick uh, in the audience. I don't know if he's listening. Uh, if he wants to make a comment, uh, um, uh, he's a world-renowned expert in ICS, uh, you know, industrial control security. Uh, uh, so, but if he might not be listening, so if he's listening, can uh, can you, um, uh, Shankar, can you? I can, actually, I can uh, yeah, I can allow him to talk, Daniel. Uh, if if in case you are here and if you can, uh, you know, I've just given you the permissions to, you know, unmute yourself just in case, uh, if it's possible. Professor. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, and if you are there, I've just given you the audio permissions. We would love to hear from you. Yes, I'm connected. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, very good, very good uh, presentation, explanations, and uh, enjoyed it very much. Uh, I'm right now, by the way, I showed that initially, Sandeep, you showed the, the Purdue model and the integration, what is located in which level. So right now I'm involved in writing a micro learning module for the ISA 6244 three and we will have some new approaches to to this topic okay all right and uh, uh, so what, what what do you think about the manpower uh, issue that uh, we uh, we are facing everywhere uh, in this uh, ICS uh, uh, OT security I tell you a uh, I do believe that the best investment organization can do is integrating the ICS uh, the so, training, sorry, not in training the I the personal in their plant. Why? Because the training activity it has the highest uh, return on investing investment among all other activities uh, which people can initiate. And uh, I know that there are many classes worldwide, okay, many classes, sons and others. However, there are not enough classes which can deal with people who have only basic knowledge in the field of industrial control system. And, and this is the charter that I myself took and conducting classes in order to take people who have only the basic knowledge in the field of ICS, IT people, managers, and bring them up speed so they can intelligently talk to vendors and the intelligently update budget for investment, which is, which is highly important as well. Oh, thank you. So that would be a very good thing to do uh, if we can. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, now uh, uh, I will uh, request the audience to uh, raise their hands so uh, Shankar can uh, open their mics uh, uh, if they have any questions. So I see Anubhav Guel, 
uh, is asking uh, and wanting to ask a question. So, uh, Shankar, can you help him? I have, I have. Yeah. Anubhav, please go ahead. Uh, hey. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, I'm, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the lovely information. Uh, this question is an open question for any of the experts to, uh, you know, uh, let let me know. Uh, it's a it's a question at a basic level since we are also you know learning more and more about the challenges on the ICS. Uh, the basic question is that once the legacy systems that have already been heavily invested in in terms of SCADA, PLC, DCS, all other OT kind of assets and uh, traditional monitoring and control systems that are in place, wired or however way it is, the moment it uh, you are bringing it to the IP level or upgrading it in a way uh, to meet the IoT you know, uh, network as, a, as such, then the, is data is data the is data the primary current in the live environment is data the primary concern in the sense of information or is or is the industry also moving towards automated controls over the ip networks that are exposed so is the control also kind of being uh, exposed or is it only the data so far which is the massive concern so, uh, it, mm. yeah. so I'm just going to make the comment that in an OT environment, uh, the data is only a means to an objective. The objective is control. The data is of little value. I'm just telling a machine, move, roll back, give me the temperature, and so on. Uh, it was practically meaningless to anybody outside the plant. The only possible exception might be maybe in certain verticals like the pharmaceutical vertical where there's a lot of intellectual property in terms of how to mix the drugs, that kind of thing. But in general, the data is almost of no worth to anybody outside the organization. The name of the game is to crash the plant, not to steal the data out of it. Uh, so uh, anybody else? So can you? Yeah, yeah, maybe um, I, I have add, a, add, a, add a little more to what you said. There might be a possibility that both are required. So data might be required to maybe design a decision taking, uh, you know, information system, uh, probably to strategize, to plan, and so on. But yes, uh, controls are one of the primary reasons which can be uh, a, a, the kind of you know. In, uh, precursor of having this overall ITOT convergence. So both might be required, but it can be in kind of, you know, 60-40 balance or something. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've got another thanks, question thanks. from Sudeep. Sudeep, if you could unmute yourself, and then gentlemen, I've got a question on QA widget as well. So uh, Sudeep, please go ahead. Am I audible, right? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful discussion. So we are, so I work for EGAN, which is incubated at IT Contour, and we work primarily in a lot of IT space. We are a startup. So particularly for startups who would want to integrate uh, some of these OT technologies into their existing SOC solutions, how can a tenable or a, uh, you know, Siemens help such startups? Or do you have such pl uh, plans for that or not? That's the question. Uh, I guess I'd like to ask a clarifying question, help you how, what would you like to see? Uh, see, Dick, we are already, so we have very good relationships with the Tenable team in India on the IT side of it. Uh, I've been in IT and IBM and Deloitte for very long. So we are developing products which basically in aggregate uh, the security alerts from different security technologies. So we are already doing it on your IT space, for example, for the security center or the Nessus products which you have. We are looking at a concept of a fusion SOC where we can also you know, collect the data from the Indergy component, which you recently bought over last year uh, from the OT space and bring it together into one risk management platform. So that is what we are trying to work on. So how can Tenable help in that? 
it sounds like an integration exercise. Um, yeah. I think this is probably uh, something that uh, I would be happy to talk to you, uh, but this yeah, is probably not the right forum for that. Exactly. Yeah. So if you can share your email and other details, yeah. I think that's what I'll, I'll do that, Sudeep. I'll definitely do that and I'll probably schedule a call separately. But thank you so much, um, Sudeep. I, I would be in touch with you. I'll take that as an action item. Thank you so much. Sure. And, yeah. and before, um, you know, I know we're at the top of the hour, but Rohit, we've got a question for you in the Q&A widget. Uh, and the question I'll read out is, I really see a sense of or sense or urgency in working on OT security. So my question for Rohit is, how do you create a business case or an ROI case for OT security? So uh, creating a business case is basically based on the impact or uh, the risk of the impact that can happen due to a cyber attack. So uh, in the last uh, uh, few months, we have seen exponential increase in the cyber attack. And, and uh, there has been a repeated and persistent push from the government side also, uh, which has resulted in quite a a uh, lot of awareness at the board level also. So uh, building a business case is basically uh, uh, can have two or three uh, uh, to put up to management. First would be the easiest one is the compliance part. So if there is a existing regulation or an upcoming regulation that is going to affect the business and it is the easiest round to uh, build up a business case because it is anywhere required. The other uh, uh, method uh, to build a business case would be uh, that your industry um, uh, currently has suffered uh, a cyber attack uh, either in the country or there is an established uh, attack pattern on your industry. Then that can be uh, a pretty good uh, way to build a business case. Uh, the third and final generic method would be to uh, build up uh, the business case on basis of uh, the attacks that are happening and what can be the possible impact on your revenues or your reputation losses. So you will have to uh, explore the impacts of uh, cyber attack on your business and uh, try to convince the management that uh, this is the cost of doing business now. So Thank that you. needs to be explained. Thank you. So Just powers, in the power sector right now, uh, the, uh, the ministry is... Uh, pushing very hard on, on security. Uh, and so it's not very difficult to uh, convince the uh, management. I mean, it's coming from very top. Gen uh, but, uh, I'm so sorry, Professor. There is one more um, hand raise, which has happened from Nitesh. If everyone's OK, can we just take one more question, please? Uh, uh, Quick one. So, yeah, Nitesh, uh, if you can hear us, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Good afternoon, all. All I'm Nitish. Uh, I'm an incubity in IIT Kanpur. So we provide this uh, security enforcement uh, uh, platform. So my question is like when we talk about security measure and posture in OT. So would we, do you prefer to be managed and administrative control in side basis, or it could be centrally managed control? Uh, system which could be multi-site. So what are the preference and other question which I had already answered, I mean, asked by Shumit, so maybe offline we can uh, collaborate. So the, the first question, maybe if you would like to answer on the administrative control, whether it is per site basis or it is a multi-site but central control. Like... So I guess Rohit? Yeah, so that depends on the kind of industry in which the OT system has been deployed. So uh, there are quite a few industries in which there is a central SCADA. So in those kind of industries, uh, a central console would be preferable. But if you look at the power sector in general, a generation company would not have a multi-site deployment of an OT environment. So in that kind of scenario, uh, per site basis of console would be preferable. So ultimately, it depends on the target consumer, uh, what is their business model and how their uh, platform works. So that is uh, what I think of. So Shankar, uh, 
I, I think that uh, we are uh, reaching the end of time, but if I can borrow three minutes, I would request each of the panelists to say in their one minute, uh, you know, final comment on uh, what they would like the audience to know uh, from their perspective on OT security. So let's start with Rohit. Uh, yeah, thanks, Professor. So uh, we have seen an exponential increase in the cyber attacks that we are facing. Uh, in the sector and in general uh, in the environment. And this is going to be much more worse going forward. So what we are witnessing, it will become manifold in coming years and we have to uh, live with it. So we have to be prepared uh, uh, to see cyber security as a cost of business. And uh, there is going to be a significant investment which is required by the organizations, by the OEMs and by the service providers also. Uh, and there is going to be a uh, continuous push from the government and the other regulators, uh, which is going to come because uh, the impacts uh, which has been seen, uh, say, in the colonial pipeline attacks, uh, where there was a disruption in the public services. So uh, the society is not going to tolerate disruption, and we, as a, a, a part of the entire society, we have to do uh, our best to uh, make our system secure. So, uh, yeah, we think that. Uh, uh, in the entire life cycle of a, a process, uh, we are going to see a lot of development and effort coming in from all the stakeholders. And they, I think we will be here. Uh, Richard? Okay. Uh, I, I think that um, it's a, I feel like it's a time bomb. Okay. And I, I think, you know, the, uh, the one example that uh, Professor you brought up during the presentation was the incident that occurred in India in around Christmas with the power grid that was said to be human error, but may or may not have been solved questionable. Uh, so I, I, I think that what I feel is, and I think it, there's a sense in the power industry in India right now, uh, there is a very strong sense of urgency to get this started and get it done and to get it done now. Um, one of the more proactive countries is the one where I'm actually living, uh, which is in, uh, Singapore, where we have already identified 11 critical infrastructures, CIIs, we call them here. And uh, it's mandated by law that uh, these CIIs have minimal levels of, of uh, operational technology security. And the nice thing about Singapore laws is it has they have teeth, okay? So if you don't uh, obey, uh, you end up getting caned and thrown in Changi prison, okay? So people tend to obey things here, but they're well-intended and they're doing their job and it's gonna protect the place. And I think every, I, I really have a strong belief in the power of government to get things done. I think that uh, uh, we need to respect that and, and, and basically get moving legislatively to mandate things because people won't spend the money unless somebody makes them spend the money. It's that simple. Generally true. Okay. Thank you. So uh, Amitabh, uh, you also wanted to answer uh, Daniel's question live. So maybe you can start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically I didn't want to answer. Basically I want to resonate what he said. So return of investment is probably the wrong approach and it has never been a successful approach where we are speaking about investment on info security or OT cyber security. So it's typically a kind of uh, the, the state of urgency as also touched by Dick and even uh, you as well, Professor, we, we need to really, uh, so OT cybersecurity is no more a choice. It's something which is a compulsion and uh, to protect our country, protect any country from any kind of uh, possible breach or possible espionage or possible attack involving, you know, a risk to human lives, risk to services and facilities. Uh, we we are, all have to, think, take it very seriously and go for it. And I'm sure government, including in India, will bring in a lot of uh, regulations as well to support and to give a kit as was, uh, you know, on a lighter side, which Dick was mentioning. I think we are already moving towards that journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I should thank uh, uh, Amitabh, uh, Rohit and Richard for spending uh, the time and Shankar and Ranjit for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to interact with this uh, very uh, fine gentleman uh, who are very well versed with the topic. And uh, also I thank the audience particularly for uh, being with us and uh, 
listening to this uh, very interesting, it's interesting to me. So a uh, very interesting discussion. And I hope to actually see the audience again in uh, another such program. And uh, with that, I will, uh, you know, pass the uh, baton to uh, Shankar to close the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And indeed, it, it, you know, it's, the topic is close to my heart as well, uh, Professor. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, Rohit, Richard, Amitabha, can't thank you enough. So, you know, with folded hands, uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. And, and um, I must say, Daniel, thank you. You, your, you know, your tips on the Q&A session were really interesting. So, and to all of you, a thank you. And uh, just before I close, it's a little personal, but Ranjit, if you're on the, on the webinar, um, and if you could, uh, you know, uh, come on video. Uh, gentlemen, Ranjit is a close friend and the best part, it's his birthday today. So Ranjit, happy birthday from all of us here. Happy birthday, Ranjit. Oh, right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And to all the audience, we would be sending the recording and the discussion. So, you know, by default, uh, you would receive an email from my end with the, with the um, recording link. So if in case you want to refer to the discussion and to the folks who could not join us, the recording link would be sent to them as well. So thank you so much. And once again, goodbye. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.